That's my title of the sermon this morning, is Israel Falau in Light of the Bible. Israel Falau in Light of the Bible. So I just wanted to preach on just the, the various issues surrounding um, this issue with Israel Falau and his court case and being dismissed by Rugby Australia and all that. And hopefully give you a biblical perspective on all the issues that are happening. I know it's hot in the media right now, so I think a lot of people are talking about it. A lot of people are probably thinking about it thinking, you know, is he doing the right thing? Should he be dismissed? Uh, should he have said those things? You know, all these different things. So I just want to cover my thoughts on the whole Israel Falau situation in light of what the Bible preaches. So first question is, who, if you haven't heard of the situation, I, I'm, I'm, I would be 99% sure that everyone in this room has probably heard about what's happening with Israel Falau. But if you don't know who he is, Israel Folau is an Australian rugby player. He plays for the Australian Wallabies. I believe he's Polynesian by ethnicity. And um, if you don't know much about him, he is actually, I believe, is a oneness Pentecostal. <laughs> so this, this uh, question has come up again, but uh, it's, it's, isn't it funny that the person taking a stand for all of us right now in Australia um, is a oneness Pentecostal? And uh, I believe so because I've seen comments from him, you know, denying uh, the Trinity and believing that, you know, um, a, a sort of oneness view of the Godhead. But also that, it's because what he believes about salvation. But even though he's a Pentecostal, I think some people might have believed that he was like a liberal Pentecostal. He, maybe he thought he was like a Hillsong type Pentecostal. But there are different types of Pentecostals out there. And generally the oneness Pentecostals are more fundamental Pentecostals. You know, they go to church, you see him wearing a shirt and a tie. Also, you'll notice that he's King James only. So if you notice a lot of his tweets, a lot of his tweets are KJV because a lot of the fundamental oneness Pentecostals are King James only. They, they defend the King James Bible. So yeah, he is King James only. He preaches holy living like we would preach. Um, and the church that he goes to is called the, church, the Truth of Jesus Christ Church. So I'm not sure who it's pastored by. But I know his dad is one of the, um, maybe the elders or one of the leaders in that church. But he's, I don't think you hear much about his dad because his dad preaches in their native language, right? In Tongan, I think their native language. So that's probably why it's like when you, when you search them and stuff like that, it's hard to find them because maybe a lot of the keywords with the sermons are all in another language. Um, and that church is actually in Sydney. It's actually somewhere in North Sydney. But, you know, because he's a oneness Pentecostal, this is the thing, even though he's taking a stand for Christianity, I don't know whether this man is actually saved. I hope he is, but I'm not sure whether he is or not. Why? Because he believes in a work salvation. Um, it says here on his tweet, I've got some of his tweets. This is probably his clearest one that was recent. Look at what he says here. To be born again, look at this, you must, capital letters, M-U-S-T, repent of your sins be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and then prayed upon, asking God to receive the Holy Spirit. If you've done it a different way from this, then you aren't born again. And then he's quoted John 3. John 3 is, you know, you must be born again. Acts 2.38 is the Pentecostals text verse, which is, you know, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, and, and you'll receive the remission of, uh, for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then Acts 19 is when Paul meets those other disciples and then he rebaptizes them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what's funny? Acts 2.38, that's their verse. And Acts 2.38, they ask the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then the Pentecostals take that verse to say, well, what should we do as believers? Yeah, we ought to be baptized. And repent of our sins as believers but you know there is a verse in the bible that asks the question what must i do to be saved and that's what he's saying here. to be born again you must do these things well if you find the question in the bible what must i do to be saved it's believe on the lord jesus christ yeah. full stop yeah. so this guy believes in a work salvation not only do he does he believe you have to repent of your sins what does that even mean if you think about it, what does it mean to repent of your sins? To repent of your sins means to keep the commandments. Right. If you don't know what repent of your sins means, this is not just some arbitrary, you know, I just don't like sin. I mean, to, re to turn from sin, you have to keep commandments to turn from sin. That's the only way you can turn from sin, is to keep commandments. So this is basically saying to be born again, you need to do works, 
You need to be baptized. What about the thief on the cross? The thief on the cross wasn't baptized and then prayed upon asking God to receive the Holy Spirit. This is what the Oneness Pentecostals believe. And this is, this is why Oneness Pentecostals are not saved. You know, it's not that they're not saved because they have a different view of the Godhead. They're not saved because they believe in work salvation. They believe in baptismal regeneration. Now, what does the Bible say in Ephesians 2? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And you know, you can prove from the Bible that turning from sin is works. Jonah 3. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God, look at this, and God saw their works. There's just no coincidence that the Bible uses the exact same word to say, hey, it's not of works. And then in Jonah 3.10, it says God saw their works. And what did he see? That they turned from their evil way. Do you see how turning from your sins is works? So that's why if somebody says you need to turn from your sins, you need to repent of your sins to be saved, that's just blatantly teaching work salvation. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. So not only does Israel allow believe and teach a works salvation, he believes in baptismal regeneration, but the Bible says about baptism, the like figure went through, even baptism doth also now save us, but not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you just see here that water baptism doesn't save you. It, it, it pictures what does save you, which is the death, burial, and resurrection. But baptism with water is the answer of a good conscience. So it's because you already have that good conscience by faith in Jesus Christ. You remember we learned about that in Hebrews, that baptism is a response to that. That's why we don't baptize babies. That's why we baptize believers and baptism has nothing to do with your salvation if it did why did the thief on the cross go to heaven and he wasn't saved i mean he wasn't he wasn't baptized but jesus said hey today you shall be with me in paradise so it's it's unfortunate that you know israel falau is standing up for god and he's trying to stand up for what's right but i truly hope this this man is safe i hope that he's just mixed up on this you know, and maybe he's just on the repentance bandwagon right now because, you know, he was, it was a time. Because this is what happens to people, right? They, they grow up understanding the right gospel and then they get into sin, right? And then people start telling them, well, maybe they're not really saved. And then they think, oh, they, they rededicate their life to Christ. This time I'm truly getting saved, right? Making this commitment. And you just think, did you truly get saved? Or did you just get duped into a work salvation? You know, now you're teaching work salvation. And now you're teaching things like this. Look at this. These are more of his tweets. When you're truly born again and you turn to Christ, your affections start changing through the Holy Spirit. Your desires and pleasures for this world start fading away and Jesus becomes your everything. It's going to be a long time for us until you know you're truly born again. I don't think anybody can claim that Jesus becomes your everything. I mean, you'd be perfect then. You'd be sinless. If Jesus was your everything, you wouldn't sin anymore. So who can ever know they're truly born? How can the Bible ever say, you know you have eternal life if it requires Jesus becoming your everything? That's works salvation. This is something that happens. This is something that we're striving for. So it's unfortunate that this is what he believes, uh, even though he's taken a stand politically for us. Look at this. To my fellow Christian brothers and sisters, if you think you're saved, because once in your life you've said a salvation prayer asking Jesus to come into your heart, then you're deceived. Most churches today are misleading people through this. This is so sad because, you know, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yeah, can people say that and not really mean it? Yeah, of course. If you don't actually, you know, if you just say words and you're not actually calling upon the name of the Lord in faith, then yeah, you're not saved. But if the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, and then he says, well, you're not saved because once in your life you've called upon the name of the Lord. I, you know, do we go with Israel for now or do we go with the Bible? You know, there's nothing, there's nothing deceiving about believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's nothing deceiving about whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what's deceiving? To think that you can be perfect. To think that Jesus can become your everything in this life and therefore get your assurance and your knowledge of knowing that you're truly born again 
from your works. That's when you're deceived. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So if you didn't know much about what Israel Folau believes, before you get too excited about him taking a stand and all that stuff, it's great that he's taking a stand for the religious freedom side. But unfortunately, we don't know whether he is actually saved. I hope he is. But he is preaching a wrong gospel and his church is believing work salvation and baptismal regeneration. So what did Israel Folau do? What was his crime according to the homosexual left? Right? This is what he did. He shared a post on Instagram. And if you read this post, this is why we read 1 Corinthians 6 this morning. And this is why this court case is so important. I mean, his post basically is paraphrasing 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, right? Warning, drunks, homosexuals, adulterers, liars, fornicators, thieves, atheists, idolaters, hell awaits you, repent, only Jesus saves. Now, I don't have necessarily a problem with what this says if you have the right definition of repentance, right? Because obviously you need to repent to believe on Jesus Christ, but you don't need to repent of sin. So we, have, we don't have an issue with this meme the issue is then how he interprets the meme, which is those that are living in sin will end up in hell unless you repent. And what he means by that is Jesus Christ loves you and is giving you time to turn away from your sin and come to him. Right? To turn away from your sin, to get your life right so that you can go to heaven. And then he quotes here Galatians 5, 19 to 21, which is another list of sins that people do. We will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the thing is we don't get to heaven by trying to not do these things, right? Because we're already guilty. We get to heaven by believing on Jesus Christ. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believe it. So if you see this passage, this meme, this is basically what 1 Corinthians 6 says. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, so that's not actually being homosexual, right? Nor effeminate, that's just being girly as a man. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. I do believe that is a reference to homosexuality. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And it's interesting that, you know, of all the things mentioned on this list, I mean, you know, you don't see the adulterers up in arms. You don't see the liars up in arms and the fornicators. It's these guys that are up in arms. Because right? these are the guys, these are the guys that are trying to make everybody think the way they think. Right? These are the guys that don't like the fact that the Bible exists. Right? The sodomites out there, the reprobate sodomites, especially, they're the ones that are kicking up the fuss and pushing this cultural Marxism into our society. So what I find interesting about this is they kicked up a fuss about this and now the media is all up in arms. But this is really basic Christianity. I mean, I don't know what's... I mean, you know, you have these media analysts and reporters growing up in the Catholic... And they're saying, well, I've grown up in church my whole life. You know, my parents took me to church and, you know, we, we've never, you know, practiced Christianity this way. We've never said these things. Yeah, well, because maybe you grew up in a church that wasn't preaching the Bible. It wasn't teaching you the Bible and it was just a God of love, love, love and hell and wrath and anger wasn't there. But that's the other side of God. The other side of God is that hell is the punishment for these sins. So there's nothing, there's nothing revolutionary or revelationary about this post. This is what the Bible has said many a time. And that's why people are saying, you know, when, when they go into court, and they swear that they're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing by the truth. They're going to do it by the very Bible they're trying to censor and saying that people cannot share these things. So prior to this controversy, I think he, ha he got into a bit of trouble as well because when the whole same-sex marriage debate came up, he, he, he posted saying he wasn't in support of it as well. And I think that landed him in a bit of hot water. And I think he got warned at the time by Rugby Australia. And then he posted this and... I don't know all the ins and outs of the situation, but I guess we'll find out about it as um, the court case goes on. So because he posted this, this was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back that Rugby Australia actually fired him from playing rugby. He was no longer allowed to play rugby anymore. And now what he's doing is he's taking Rugby Australia, uh, that organisation, to court for un 
fair dismissal. And um, I think that's, uh, that's all up in, all happening now. So what are my initial thoughts on this whole situation? One thing is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that somebody's taking a stand. Because even though we may disagree with him doctrinally, I'm glad that somebody is taking a stand of that caliber, right? Of that profile for our freedom to be able to practice Christianity in Australia. Because, you know, I'm sure Israel is not the first to lose his job over his beliefs. You just don't hear about it. Right? I mean, we, I know people personally that have expressed things in the workplace and then they've been pressured to take money to leave the job. And you may know other people like that too. So Israel Falau, it's not like he's the first person that this has happened to. And this wave of people, you know, this, this act, this, these, uh, these actions from corporations and whatnot is building up. That's why he's got so much support. But what's great about this is that, you know, somebody of such high profile willing to take on this fight. Because if you think about it, most people that come across a situation like this where they're pressured and they're actually, you know, the, 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 the Australian law is not being upheld in, t in terms of their religious freedom in this country, won't take on this fight. Why? And you can understand, right? Because if somebody was not of the caliber of Israel Falau, number one is you have, to, you have to be quite a resilient person to go through something like that. In terms of, you know, the, the vitriol that you're going to get from the Sodomites, from the media left, you know, all the comments that are going to come flowing. A lot of people can't take it. They shut off all their social media and they, they sometimes become depressed and whatnot because they're just not used to taking that level of criticism from so many people. So number one, like most people don't want to go through that and kind of, you know, have their name dragged through the mud and their life ruined, you know, taking a stand for a lot of people that may not even appreciate what they're taking a stand for. So not only that, but some people don't have the financial backing as well. You know, so, I mean, if Israel Falau you know, isn't successful, he at least has maybe some, some income that he can live off. Whereas some, some people, that might destroy their financial income and even destroy, because this is going to destroy maybe even your prospects of getting a job in the future. And number three, like, like I said, not everyone has the profile in order to get the public support and the funding to be able to fight such a high, you know, legal battle, such a big battle that's going to set these sorts of precedents. So I'm glad, you know, even though we disagree doctrinally. You know, I'm not going to just be so down on the guy that you won't even support and be happy that he's taking the stand. Yeah, I wish he believed right about the gospel. I wish he believed right about these things. But that doesn't mean I have to be down about the fact that he's taking a stand because I do believe ultimately, you know, it benefits all of us. So, like I said, not everyone's willing to to be a public martyr. Not everyone has the financial ability and not everyone has the profile to get the support required to go to court. What else? False teachers. And as always, watered down Christianity is not helping at all. Right? Because you've got people like Brian Houston, who is the leader of the Hillsong Pentecostal movement. He wrote, I don't know if you know this, but he wrote an open letter to Israel Folau basically saying, the title of it, because he wrote it and I think he submitted it to, I can't remember who it was, like the Sydney Morning Herald or something like that. He wrote an article. And you know what the title of it was? We don't need more judgmental Christians. So obviously these guys are not helping at all. Look at some of the things he wrote in his article. I won't read it all, but one thing he says is scaring people doesn't draw them into the love of Jesus. Sometimes I wonder what Bible these people are reading. You know, they're, you know, they're just teaching what they learn from the world and they're just teaching like worldly philosophies because if scaring people doesn't draw them into the love of Jesus, why does the Bible say, and others save with fear? Yes. Right? Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. This sounds like fear does work on some people. Fear does draw people to the love of Jesus because they realize what they're being saved from. You know, to me, if, with, with, without the punishment of hell, that diminishes the love of God because otherwise it diminishes what he did for you, what he went through for you. The fact that you know that, hey, what I've done deserves an eternity of hell and I was spared for that magnifies the love of God. 
Right? And it's because people are taught, that, you know, they're growing up, taught loving God, loving God, a loving God, and no wrath and no judgment, that they grow up thinking, well, why would a loving God create hell? Right? They ask questions like that. Well, it's because they have the wrong view of God, like Brian Houston. Brian Houston is one of the reasons why people fall out of Hillsong. You know, you, you know when you, you, ever, you ever see those testimonies where it's like, I used to be a pastor and I got out of it. Nine times out of ten, it's like a charismatic Pentecostal preacher. Why? Because they get into the ministry thinking, oh, I'm serving God, I'm going to be healthy, wealthy and wise, it's going to love God, and then they start thinking, why does a loving God create hell? Why is my life so hard? Why am I depressed? You know, I'm, I'm serving God, I'm a leader in the church. I've seen testimonies like that. Look at this, the world doesn't need more judgmental Christians. In the eyes of many, the church is not relevant to their lives and is seen to be stuck in the past. You know what's so hypocritical about this statement? It's Brian Houston, if he didn't write this letter, there'd be one less judgmental Christian in the world. You know, because people think, oh, you're so judgmental. What do you think that is? That's a judgment on somebody that they're judgmental. So it's just so, hypo it's so hypocritical to, be, to say, don't be judgmental. Because the very fact that you're saying that is you're making a judgment. So he's saying we need less judgmental Christians in the world. And then he pens an open letter. Is Ralph allowed? You're so, you're so wrong. You shouldn't be doing this. This is not the God. It's, it's just hypocrisy, right? That's why the Bible doesn't say don't judge. Yeah, in Matthew 7 it says don't judge lest ye be judged. It's saying don't be a hypocrite like these people. But that's why Jesus said in John 7, 24, Judge not according to the appearance. Look at this. But judge righteous judgment. You see, there's a right way to judge and there's a wrong way to judge. It's just not that there's no judgment at all. Philippians 1. And this I pray. And look how it links it in with love. That your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. So is, if your love is increasing, you know, when they say, oh, we, let's just, we don't want to focus on hate. We don't want to focus on the negative. We should focus on the love of God. Well, if you're focusing on the love of God, are you going to increase in judgment or are you going to decrease in judgment? So this is why the world doesn't need less judgmental Christians. The world needs more judgmental Christians. We need more Christians that can discern and judge and rebuke things that are wrong. Not, we don't need more Brian Houstons. So yeah, we don't need more Brian, those sort of judgmental Christians in the world. We need the righteous more righteous judgmental Christians in the world. This is the last thing that he said, right? I would never compromise the integrity of biblical teaching and I believe the Bible is clear about the consequences of sin. Well, what are they, Brian Houston? Because when somebody says what the consequences of sin are, you start saying, oh, it's, burnt, it's turn and burn, it's going to turn people away. Well, how clear are you when somebody just says what the consequences are for sin and just post basically a Bible verse that you have a problem with it. However, as Christians, we are first called to love God and to love other people, including those who believe differently to us. So, I mean, I wouldn't agree, I, mean, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with this statement. The problem is, when he, you know, he's not being clear about the consequences of sin because he doesn't even want to mention hell. He doesn't want to mention punishment. All these things. Look at these, look at these verses from Galatians 4. And I tell, I, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Yes. And you know, this is something that, you know, Israel, if you see the, the back and forth on Twitter between Israel Falau and Brian Houston, he actually quoted this to him. And I think that's, you know, he's, at least he's, he's got the right philosophy, just the wrong doctrines, right? But look at this. I don't know if you've ever seen this verse. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul writing to the Corinthians says, and I will, be, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Isn't that interesting? Because people, see these people saying, oh, he's just so unloving, and in the media saying, oh, you, uh, don't you realize people are going to be offended by this? But that's the problem, because sometimes the truth hurts. But if you love them, you know, one verse he should quote is from Proverbs, right? Faithful are the wounds of a friend, or the kisses of... Our enemy, a deceit. But look at this. Paul is saying, hey, the more I love you, the more I tell you the truth, the more I try and teach you the truth, the actually the less I be loved. Because people get upset sometimes at hearing the truth. 
So let's go on to the next question. The next question is, should we support him? Because like I said, a lot of people, because of his wrong doctrinal stance on salvation, just say, I don't want anything to do with him. I don't think that's wise. Or, you know, for other reasons, people might say, you know, I don't want to get involved in this fight. I don't want to support him financially or whatnot. So I want to just explore this question and give you some of my thoughts on why I think we should support him, um, but also some thoughts around the issues surrounding it. Now, the first issue is religious discrimination. Religious discrimination. <clears throat> so I might teach some things this morning that might be a bit of a shock to you, but I want to explain why I come from this point of view. Should a business in Australia, or in any country, should a business be able to discriminate based on religion? If you've bought into world philosophy and liberty philosophy, you might say, oh, no, never. Business should never be able to discriminate on religion. That's wrong. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, these things. But the thing is, all of us discriminate every day as a business when we decide who to hire, right? When you think about it, right? If you're moving house and then a, two, two pregnant ladies show up, you know, maybe it's like the two pregnant ladies moving company. I mean, is that, is that going to be the first company you choose to help you move, especially if they charge by the hour? You, you're probably not going to choose them, right? But you, you, you're allowed that, right? You don't, you don't say, you know, somebody doesn't come along and say, hey, don't discriminate just because they're pregnant and they're women. You should hire them. No, you'd say, no, I, 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 I discriminate because there's a difference. It's going to make a difference. It's no different if you have a religious organization. You know, you're going to discriminate when you're trying to purchase labor, which is what you're doing when you're hiring people. You're going to discriminate based on what they believe, based on, you know, their sexual orientation, you know, because you believe certain things about homosexuality, about fornication, you want a certain level of standard. So you're not going to do that. I mean, maybe women, when they go to the doctor or they hire a midwife, don't you prefer a female with midwife? Oh, you bigot. You, you, really, uh, can't, you know, we, we should put you in jail. This is discriminating, you know, based on gender. No, because people make, and, and they afford themselves that freedom. I don't think anyone on the left would say, oh, you can force me to choose what doctor I have if they prefer a female or a male. But when it comes to a business, and this is why people don't understand this, because you think about it, businesses are just run by people. That's why business owners understand this. But most people have not run a business. Most people are employees. So they're expecting stuff from the business. Oh, the business should do this for me. This is do. When you're the business owner, the one that's actually making the decision of who to buy, right? Just like you decide, okay, I'm going to hire this person to mow my lawn. I'm going to hire this person to paint my house. I'm going to hire this person to move. Think about it. You're making a business decision and you discriminate. You know, you may prefer a Christian person to a Muslim person. You may prefer a male to a female. You, you may prefer somebody straight as opposed to homosexual. Right? Because you may not want to be around homosexual. But if a business does it, then all of a sudden people are like, well, business shouldn't be allowed. You know, businesses should be, you know, hire everyone, not discriminate. No, they should be. Businesses should be allowed to discriminate in a free society, right? in, in a free market. So cultural organizations may need to discriminate based on race. They may prefer because they have a purpose of their business. Or labor businesses may need to discriminate based on gender, and religious organizations may need to discriminate based on religion and sexual orientation. So really, you know, should businesses be able to discriminate? Well, they should. But where it gets a bit complicated is because Rugby Australia, now when you have the government in business, the government supporting ones and setting up monopolies over another, and the government has a law not to discriminate. Then the question is, well, Rugby Australia, is Rugby Australia really, should really be run like a private organization? Because it's taking government funds. I mean, we've all paid taxes. You know, all the rugby players have paid taxes into funding Rugby Australia. Why should certain people be excluded from that? So that's where it comes down to Israel Folau's case. So, Religious discrimination, there's nothing wrong with it inherently, right? So it's not that we should just fight for a society that just has no religious discrimination at all because people should be able to discriminate based on religion, gender, and whatnot. What about religious freedom? Is the fight about religious freedom 
should a society have freedom of religion? This is another thing where people hear and they just say, what? That, of course we should have freedom of religion. Everyone should be able to practice and believe and preach whatever they want. But is this a biblical concept? Well, I think if you read through the Bible, I think you'd be hard-pressed to walk away with a society that ought to have religious freedom. Let's just read Deuteronomy 13. And this is God setting up the nation of Israel. And as you read through Deuteronomy 13, ask yourself whether God thinks a society should have religious freedom. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known. Let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him, and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he had spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shalt thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. And thou shalt stone him with stones that he die, because he hath sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. And all Israel shall hear and fear, and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. If thou shalt hear say in one of thy cities, which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, saying, Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you, and I have and, and I, and I've withdrawn the inhabitants uh, of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently, and behold, if it be truth, and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, and destroying it utterly, and all that is therein, and the cattle thereof and with the edge of the sword. And thou shalt gather all the spoil of it into the midst of the street thereof, and shalt burn with fire the city and all the spoil thereof, every whit, for the Lord thy God, uh, and it shall be a heap forever, it shall not be built again. And there shall cleave naught of the cursed thing to thine hand, that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger, and show thee mercy, and have compassion upon thee, and multiply thee as he has sworn unto thy fathers. When thou shalt hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep all his commandments which I command thee this day, to do that which is right, in the eyes of the Lord, of thy God, uh, that show, uh, no wickedness, that shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. Okay, I think I might have actually accidentally <laughs> pasted that in there. Eyes of the Lord thy God. So it ends there. Now when you read that passage in Deuteronomy 13, do you get an idea that when God set up a society, it's just religious freedom? No. The, the religious freedom, why do, let's just think this, this for a second. Why doesn't religious freedom work in a society well try having religious freedom in your own home and running your home that way where people can just believe whatever they want say whatever they want i mean how are you meant to keep your family in order right and set some law and order down it's the same in a society how do you expect a society to stay godly when the majority of people are going to be either unsaved or walking in the flesh they're going to have equal say in a democracy, right, where it's basically rule of the majority. So the majority is going to go towards false religions. They're going to go towards sin. Why would you want to be ruled by a democratic society with freedom of religion? This is why God didn't set it up that way. This is why Israel wasn't a democracy. 
There wasn't votes. There were laws put in place and then judges to execute those laws. Now, am I saying that today this is how it should work in Australia? No, because this is not just individuals carrying out judgment. This is not somebody says something and then you just take it into your own hands and kill them. I know it sounds a bit like that when you're reading it, but when you take all of the Old Testament into account, there was a judge system, right? Well, that's why it says you don't conceal him because you're not like you hear it from him. You don't keep it a secret. You need to reveal it and take him to court to the judges and then he's executed. And then when in those days it was a stoning, right? Saying if you take him to court, you're going to be the first one to throw that stone. Right? So it builds this hatred of false religion in that society. Now, people all obviously think, well, if you were to do that today, you'd be like killing people left, right, and center. Yeah, well, that's because that's not how it's meant to work, where you just like institute it in. Obviously, that would be a radical change, and that's why it's probably not going to happen. You know, we'll never get to the point where we have a biblical system set up, and we're not called to do that. That's why, because in order to set up a biblical system in a country, there'd probably have to be a civil war. But we're not called to do that, right? Because we're not called to wrestle against flesh and blood. So our, our fight is a spiritual fight. So we can talk about these concepts and realize what the ideal situation is. But whether we get there is another issue. So this is not individuals carrying this out of their own accord. There is a system set up. But because in Australia we're not under this form of government, you know, government doesn't do this. Right? Government doesn't punish people that worship a false god and things like that. And this is why our country is where it is. You, know, if you say, why is our country going down the tube? Why? It's because it's a democracy with freedom of religion and freedom of speech, and anybody can come here and teach a false god and lead people astray, and that's a right you have in Australia. You're legally protected to do that, as opposed to legally prohibited from doing that. So, freedom of religion is not something that is an ideal, even though that's what the current law in Australia is. What about freedom of speech? Are you allowed to say whatever you want in a society? Leviticus 24. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. Now that happens a lot today, doesn't it? And they brought him unto Moses, and his mother's name was Shalomith, the daughter of Dibri, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in ward that the mind of the Lord might be showed them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp, and let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall surely stone him, as well the stranger as he that is born in the land. So you see how this applies to everyone that is under the government of Israel in these days. When he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall he be put, shall be put to death. So of course it would be a radical change if you were to implement and change a country from one system to another. That's why God, he replaced the countries that were in the promised land and set up the nation of Israel. So you, it's not that if you have laws like this, people are just going to be getting killed left, right and center. Because if you had a law like this, people wouldn't be just teaching a false God openly. People wouldn't just be blaspheming the name of God. You knew what the punishment was. It wouldn't just be rampant. See, that's why adultery and homosexuality and all these sins right now that warrant the death penalty, like abortion, like adultery, like homosexuality, where they should be a capital punishment crime, you wouldn't just be killing people left, right and centre in a society because if these laws existed, people wouldn't be doing them. Right? That's what Anthony Mundine said. You know, they're not out, it's funny, that's what uh, uh, Tim was saying. You know, Anthony Mundine, a Muslim, was saying, you know, that he's against homosexuality. I don't, I don't remember the outcry from the left when Anthony Mundine said, well, you know what? In our society, because it was punished by the death penalty, you wouldn't touch it. You wouldn't go there. So he had the right idea, right? Where if, if it was against the law and it was a capital punishment crime, that's the strongest form of deterrent. So you don't read these laws in the Bible and think, oh, God's such a tyrant. No, you, you then start to learn, man, this is what God thinks about these sins. This is what God, he knows the effect of these sins in a society. That's why the people that are doing it are removed from society, right? So that it doesn't affect society in that way. 
So democracy, you know, unfortunately is not ideal. But you know, we're not called to try and change countries by force. You know, that's why it, it's good that we have the freedom in Australia to practice Christianity, because that's our goal. Right? So it's not that if you think about it, when it comes to freedom of religion, I'm a Bible believer first, and then an Australian sometime after that. Right? Obviously, there are some priorities before being a patriotic Australian. But because you're a Bible believer first, our goal, if you think about it, is not just to get freedom of religion because we want freedom of religion. The reason, see, freedom of religion is a, is a means to an end. Right? Because the means is, well, we're probably not going to change the country in terms of setting up biblical government. So we live in this country, we have to operate in this country, and the fact that Australia has a law that it allows freedom of religion, that allows us to practice Christianity. That's the goal. The goal is a society where you can practice freely Christianity, whether that's a biblical society or whether it's a society that allows freedom of religion, where you can do it, right? So I would rather a society that has freedom of religion than a society that is excluding Christianity, which is the way that our society is going. And that's why we need to fight against it to just maintain the status quo. So that's why I support it. Because you might ask the question, well, Victor, if you're against freedom of religion, if you're against freedom of speech, why are you supporting Israel Falau? Well, it's because I want to maintain freedom of religion because I understand the fact that I'll, we'll probably never get to the point where we have a biblical society. That's going to happen when Jesus returns. So while we're here, let's maintain at least the freedom to practice Christianity. And if that means in Australia to defend the law of religious freedom, let's try and defend it because if we don't, what's going to happen is Christianity slowly is going to get excluded from freedom of religion. When you can practice every other religion except Christianity. And that's what we have to fight against so we can maintain that freedom. So why do I still support Israel Folau? You know, like I said, because we don't live in a perfect country. You know, and our battle is a change of this law, right? It's a change of government, but it's unlikely, because that would likely require a civil war. And that's why Ephesians 6 says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. So there is another battle that is larger, which is should these laws even be there? Well, they shouldn't be there, but that's a harder battle to win. So we are already there where these laws do exist, so let's make sure that those laws, like the Bible says here, allow us to lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Romans 12, look at what it says here. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably, with all men. So there may come a day where it's not possible to live peaceably with all men. If Israel loses and Christian sharing the Bible is no longer allowed, it's outlawed, is that going to change what we're going to do? No. We're going to keep preaching the Bible. We're going to keep going soul winning. You're going to keep preaching the gospel and preaching the Bible. It's just going to make it a bit harder to do peaceably. Right? So if it be possible, as much as I think you live peaceably with all men, but there is an opportunity now to preserve at least that freedom that we have as Christians to practice Christianity. So this is why I'm not just blindly for freedom of religion. That's why if you ask me, should we ban the burqa? Should we ban Muslim immigration? Should we ban the practice of Islam in Australia? Amen! Get it out of Australia! I don't want Islam in Australia. I want, I want Australia to be a Christian nation. So I'm not just so for freedom of religion that every religion is welcome here. So that's why I can plainly say I'm against the Burke, I'm against Islam. When you say, well, don't you want religious freedom to practice Christianity? Yeah, I want religious freedom to practice Christianity. I don't want religious freedom so you can practice Islam. And you say like, well, you know, Victor, that's, that's not very fair. That's not very equal. I don't know if you've met me before, but I don't think everything should be equal. Amen. Hello, my name is Victor. I don't know if you've met me. I'm the bishop of this church. I don't think everything should be equal. I don't think genders should be equal. There's different roles for man and wife. Yeah, they're equal in value, but there's a difference between them. Not every gender, not, not, not every gender. The two genders, not both genders are equal. They're, not, they're different. Just like not all religions are equal. 
Right? There is one true religion and there is many false religions. Not all sexual orientations are equal. Some are right. I mean, one is right. All the rest are wrong. Right? And I wouldn't even, you know, I wouldn't even go so far to say not all races are equal because I don't believe in race. Right? There's, no, there's only one human race. Right? Race is like a, a different color skin. You know what I mean? But you can say not all ethnicities are equal, right? And generally that's because of cult cultural differences based on, you know, what they believe about what's right and wrong. So like I said, I'm not supporting Israel because I believe false religions should have the freedom to be practiced. I'm supporting Israel because if I have the choice between an atheistic, homosexual Australia that excludes Christianity and an atheistic, you know, or sort of Christian-based you know, Australia that allows freedom of religion, that's the choice I would rather. And that's really where the fight is. The fight is, is are we going to at least maintain the freedoms we have now as Christians or, uh, you know, are we going to get excluded from this freedom of religion? So just keep that in mind. You know, sometimes we buy into these worldly concepts and they sound good, but are they biblical? And that's why you need to beware, like the Bible says, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So we always have to make sure our philosophies, even our political philosophies, line up with the Bible. And that doesn't mean that we don't support... It's like with Israel Folau. Yeah, we don't agree with everything that he believes, but that, does that mean we can't support him? So it's like saying with political things. Just because I don't agree that a country should necessarily have freedom of religion, that doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to go against somebody fighting for it if that's going to benefit my end goal, which is to be able to practice Christianity in Australia. That's my thoughts around that. <laughs> the last thing I want to cover around the whole Israel Folau situation that maybe you guys get, uh, have thoughts about is his appeal for donations. Because what happened when he decided to take it to court, he put an appeal out there publicly to say, hey, if you want to support this fight, donate, right? And most Australians had sense, right? And they realized that the fight was more than just about Israel Folau. And it was amazing that, you know, he, he raised like $750,000 on GoFundMe in four days, and then GoFundMe shut him down. And that just sort of confirmed that there is a bias against Christianity, right? Because then everyone's on the left is saying, why should he be on GoFundMe, blah, blah. And there's all these other things on GoFundMe. There's politicians on GoFundMe and all sorts of things on GoFundMe. He gets taken down. Then the ACL takes up the banner and says, we're going to collect money for you. And then in like two or three days, they raise almost like $4 million. <laughs> Insane. It just shows that people understand the impact of this high-profile case. But see, he got a lot of heat from asking for money. Why? Because he, he's obviously very well off himself. You know, he's one of the best Australian rugby players on a million dollar contract at the time. So he's earning millions of dollars and he has a lot of property and whatnot. And people were saying, well, you've got so much money. Why don't you pay for it all yourself? So the question is, is it right? Is it okay for Israel Folau, who's well off himself, to appeal to the public for donations. Now, why does this initially just not sit right with people, a rich person asking for money? The reason why initially it doesn't sit right with you is because generally when you think of people asking for money for something, you think of a charitable purpose. And when you think of ch a charitable purpose, it's usually somebody's asking for money because they need help personally. Am I right? That's what you probably think of. You probably think, well, if somebody needs help personally, like somebody who's sick, somebody's in financial trouble, Right? And it's like a personal gain. If they've got millions of dollars, why are they asking me, who has like a fraction of their fortune, to try and help them get out of their personal problem? So that's why I think people initially would have that reaction of, yeah, like why would a rich person be asking for money? But then you need to understand that the reason why they're asking for an appeal is because it's not, it, this is no longer just about Israel for that. Because right, if it was just about him and about his money and about his job, you know, he was offered money from Rugby Australia to take the post down and, and have no problems. It's just that he refused to do it. So he, if it was about money, he could have just taken the money and just gone, right? And just would have had a payout. 
So it's not just about the money, now it's about the impact of the legal case. So when it comes to now a cause that benefits more than just that individual, right? It's not just giving to somebody who's sick, giving to somebody who's in a bit of financial trouble. Now you're giving to somebody for a cause that you believe in, for a cause that you support, because you realize the benefit of that cause being successful has a positive impact on, just, on more than just the individual. That's when you can appeal for funds. And it's right to do that. Because why should one person, just because they've done well in their life, foot the bill for you? You know, like, because if he wins this court case, it's going to help you. It's going it's to allow us to practice Christianity. Why would Christians be saying, well, they should pay for it himself? Because it, what, the outcome of this court case is going to benefit you as well. Why should Israel Falau, just because he's done well in life, have to pay it all himself? He has to be crucified publicly, socially, right? He's got, to take, he's got to go through all the court cases. He's got to spend the time, he's spending his life doing that rather than doing maybe the things that he would prefer doing. He's got to go through that. Not only you're expecting him now to spend all his fortunes just to protect your freedom. So I think it's fair that he can appeal to the public to say, hey, do you want to be a part of this? Do you want to, do you want to play your part? And then we can all fight this together as to people just saying, well, why don't you just pay for it all? That is a wrong mindset, especially when it's something that benefits all of us. Look at what 1 Corinthians 9 says, because it's similar really in, in church as well. You know, like if somebody has the mindset, well, oh, a preacher has a lot of money, why doesn't he just pay for everything? Well, it's because having a church doesn't just benefit just the preacher, right? It benefits other people. So yeah, if it's the preacher just asking for money for personal gains, yeah, but if they're asking, hey, we're trying to build a cause, trying to build a community, that's what you're giving towards as well. So it's a benefit that's greater than just the individual. And that's the same thing in church. It's the same thing for political causes. Look at this in 1 Corinthians 9. This is biblical. Who goeth the warfare at any time at his own charges? See, if somebody is going into the fight as a soldier, He's saying, well, he's not expected to pay his own way. See, the people that he's protecting, like when the soldiers go out to fight, it's not like they have to make their millions and then pay to protect you and then you get the protection and then you don't do anything. It's saying here, no, if somebody goes to war, the, the country actually pays them to go to war because why should they go at their own charge? They're already out there putting themselves out there at risk and in danger. Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Who feedeth the flock? And eateth not of the milk of the flock. He's saying, well, you, you know, they should obviously, obviously also benefit from what they're trying to build. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the ox, the mouth of the ox, right, treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen, or saith he it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope. What does that say? That's saying the one that's doing the work knows that if he does the work, he's going to be provided for. He's going to also benefit from what he's doing. But it says, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. So you see how he's saying here, the one that's plowing, doing the work, does it in hope, but the one that reaps, right, the one that also reaps a benefit from the work that that ox is doing should be partaker of his hope, meaning like they should help and fund that. Well, it's supposed, you know, helping to feed your cat. Obviously, if you want your ox to tread the corner, you've got to feed them. It's the same with people going to war. You've got to provide for them so they can go and do that work. So it's fine for Israel to ask for donations. I don't think people should have this mindset that just because he's rich, he has to foot the entire bill. I mean, he's probably already given more than most people have to the cause. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands he's already spent just fighting in the internal battles. Now it's going public and going to the high court. He's already donating more hundreds of thousands. I mean, and people are complaining because they don't want to donate like $10 or $20 or whatever. Just a little bit to just help the cause. But I think a lot of people get the point, And that's why he has raised so much. But don't buy into this idea that it's wrong for somebody to ask for money for a cause, even when they already have money. What's wrong is the expectation that they should have to pay all of it themselves, especially when you benefit from it yourself. The last thing I want to talk about is this idea when people say, um, shouldn't the money go to those in need? I just, 
it's so funny when people say this because it's like, it's like Jesus knew that people one day, when they're giving money to a cause other than to somebody that's sick and poor, that they would say that, that they would accuse Christians of saying, oh, look, you're spending all this money on this cause, on Israel, this court case. Aren't there poor people and sick people that could use that money better? I don't know if you've ever read this passage in John 12. But this is the passage where Mary, I believe it's Mary Magdalene, it could be, because there's three Marys that follow Jesus that we know about, right? Mary, his mother, Mary Magdalene, and the other Mary. It says, then Jesus, if you ever read this story, this is when Mary anoints Jesus' feet. Right? Look what he says here. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. So this is just after, because John 11 is one of the climactic chapters in John where Jesus raises Lazarus um, after three days. Um, there they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odour of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, now note who's saying this. Note who's about to say this. Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Isn't that what you hear today? Why are people giving millions of dollars to Israel Folau when it could be given to the poor? Then he said, this he said, look at this, not that he cared for the poor, you think Judas cares about Paul, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put there. So he carried the bag and he helped himself. So he's, he's, he's not saying sell this and give it to the poor because he cares about poor people. It's because he was stealing from Jesus. And you know these people on the left, they're not saying don't give to Israel, for give to them because they care about the sick and the poor. They're just against the cause. You know, where were they about the sick and the poor? Were they giving millions and millions of dollars to the Yes campaign? You know, where are they, where is, when they're giving millions and millions of dollars to politicians, where's all the uproar? Why isn't this money getting given to the poor? And they just think, people just think this is like just a Christian ideal, that we don't spend our money on anything else but for sick and poor people. Now, am I against giving money to sick and poor people? Of course not, because it doesn't have to be one or the other. You can support both. But look at how Jesus responds to this. He says, then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. So what is the point he's making here? Sometimes an event comes or a cause comes that's a one in a lifetime opportunity. You need to get behind it. Because he's saying, hey, you're always going to have the opportunity to give to the poor. You're always going to have the opportunity to give to the sick. Why? Because there's always going to be poor and sick people to give to. But sometimes something happens where there's a cause or an event that is once in a lifetime. I mean, this is once in a lifetime for Mary. When she's met Jesus, he's about to go to the cross and she's doing something special for him. She's commended for it. So it's the same here. There is once in a lifetime opportunity here. This may be the fight that preserves religious freedom in Australia, that allows us to practice Christianity. Or this could be the court case that makes it harder for us to practice Christianity because now it's going to be illegal to just share a Bible verse on your social media without losing your job. So realise the impacts. And that's why it's so funny that this is in there. And every time I read this, I just think, every time somebody says, oh, couldn't this money be given to the poor? I just think, yeah, that's what Judas thought. Judas thought, Judas Iscariot thought that the, that ointment should have been sold and given to the poor. And Jesus swiftly corrects him by saying, the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. So we better get behind and realise the importance of some of these issues while we still have the freedom to do so. Anyways, I hope you learned a bit about the Israel Folau issue, why it's important, why I think we should support him, even though we're not going to achieve a perfect world, a biblical world, because that's going to happen when Jesus returns. But I think our goal here as Christians is, 
Hey, we need to maintain the freedoms that we have in a country like Australia so we can maintain the ability to practice Christianity. And if that means other religions can practice here too, and we're in a bit of a derby with all of them in a country like Australia, then so be it. Because if the alternative is the exclusion of Christianity, that's what we've got to fight against. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, this situation. I just thank you for at least Israel's boldness to take a stand because I'm sure many of us, Lord, when given the same opportunity to take a stand for you, would likely fail and shade into the, um, fall into the shadows. I just pray, Lord, that Israel is saved, that he's just mixed up on these things. I pray that he doesn't believe that these good works that he's doing is somehow securing his place in heaven. I know he's been teaching that and believing that now. I just pray, Lord, it's just something he's gone into later as opposed to what he's always believed and is possibly not saved. So we just pray, Lord, for the freedom we have to preach Christianity. Help us to understand things from a Bible perspective. And I just pray, Lord, that whatever happens, that you would be glorified and that you would give us the grace and the boldness to continue to do what's right, regardless of the circumstances. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.